Good morning, everybody. It's Throwback Thursday, and I'm back with another Thistle Cottage collection highlight today. Today, I'm going to talk about some of the items in our collection that actually came from the Duncan family who built the house. The items I'm talking about today are from the wedding of Andrew Wallace Duncan and Ethelwyn Richardson. Andrew Wallace Duncan was William Graham Duncan's older son. He lived in Greenville and worked as secretary treasurer for the Duncan Coal Company at the time of his marriage in 1905. Ethelwyn Richardson was the daughter of Emma and John Wesley Richardson, a former mayor of Hampton, Virginia, where Ethelwyn, or Winnie as her friends and family called her, lived. Andrew and Winnie married on May 31, 1905 at the Hampton Baptist Church in Virginia. Since both families were well known and respected in their communities, there's quite a bit of information available about their wedding. Several newspapers in Kentucky and Virginia covered the wedding both before and after the event. Due in part to the news coverage, we know that in addition to some friends, the wedding party included both of Andrew's siblings, brother W.G. Duncan Jr. and sister Katie Bell Duncan, as well as both of Winnie's sisters, Annie, Isabel, and Emma, who later married W.G. Jr. We even know from those news articles what kind of decorations and flowers were used for the wedding. But those descriptions in the newspaper are just that, descriptions. Even better than that is actual physical memorabilia, and we're fortunate to have some of that as well. One piece of physical memorabilia we have from the Duncan Richardson wedding is the Bride's Book. This book is a wealth of information. It's similar to a scrapbook or baby book, but each page contains some sort of information relating to the wedding. The book includes more descriptions of the wedding, as well as swatches of the fabric used for the wedding party's apparel. There are also photos, newspaper clippings, including some of those we already referenced, a list of wedding guests and wedding party participants, a copy of the invitation, and even a list of the gifts the happy couple received. Best of all, the book includes the marriage certificate signed by the officiant, E. Pendleton Jones, and witnesses. We also have a framed photo of the wedding party. This is an interesting photo because with most wedding photos, the bride and groom are posed front and center. That's not the case here. The wedding party is posing on a flight of steps in this photo, and Andrew and Winnie are in the center, but they're on the top step, with the rest of the wedding party in front of them on the lower steps. You can only identify Andrew and Winnie as the bride and groom in this photo because of their clothing. Speaking of which, that's one last bit of memorabilia we have from the wedding. Clothing. We have Winnie's wedding dress. The dress is a high-necked, short-sleeved ensemble made of a layer of sheer silk crepe de chine over a silk taffeta lining. The yoke is made of lace, and the sleeves are multi-tiered, ruffled crepe de chine. Because the dress is made of silk, it is incredibly fragile. Antique silk is prone to shattering, which means the fabric breaks apart easily due to the use of metals or salts in the production of the material. The fabric becomes very brittle with age, and the threads can simply snap. Handling speeds up the process, as does exposure to bright light, but even the weight of gravity can cause the material to break apart into shards. Winnie's dress is not immune to this process. Silk that was produced before 1930 often began to shatter within just a few years of its production, and this particular dress, being made in 1905, has had many years, even before it came into our hands, to suffer those effects. Fortunately, the outer layer of crepe de chine is still in good shape, it is slightly yellowed from age and has a few snags and tears, but for the most part, it is still intact. The interior layer of silk taffeta is another story altogether. Much of the skirt has simply broken away from the thread that was used to sew the dress together. We do still have a few larger sections that remain in place, and there are narrow strips along the seams that remain intact. There's also a ruffle around the bottom of the skirt that is mostly intact, probably because there wasn't much weight tugging it downward since it was the, at the bottom of a floor-length gown. Since the problem of silk shattering is inherent to the material, there isn't much we can do to stop it, but we have taken the actions that we can to prevent the problem from getting any worse. We received a preservation grant in 2016, 
and we consulted a textile expert, Jennifer Hine, as part of that project to help with not only this dress, but also the other cloth articles in our collection. She advised us and helped us make sure the dress is as secure and as supported as it can be. Sometimes a backing can be added to shattering silk to stabilize it, but that isn't an option for us right now due to the costs involved, as well as the extent of the damage already. Instead, we keep the dress in low light to avoid further deterioration, and we handle it as carefully and as little as possible. It is displayed on a mannequin with supportive padding to help take some of the weight and stress off the material of the dress itself, and we keep an extra layer of fabric under the feet of the mannequin to protect the hem of the dress from the wood of the floor and any dirt, dust, or other contaminants that may be on it. Upon the advice of Ms. Hine, we also collected the remnants of silk that fell off the dress and have stored those in a bag that we keep with the dress. That way we will still have some of that part of the item, even if it continues to, deter to deteriorate. Anytime we do have to move or handle the dress, we collect any additional pieces that break off and add those to the bag, and we log every action we take so we have a record of what we've done. Of course, Winnie's bridal gown is not the only textile item involved in the wedding. She also had a reception gown, a traveling gown, and more, all of which are described and have fabric samples included in the bride's book, but the dress in our collection, being the bridal gown, was the most unusual and striking. And of course, the other members of the bridal party were also clothed appropriately for the occasion. We have part of Andrew's tuxedo, the jacket and pants, in our collection as well, and that is on display along with Winnie's dress, but it is just a normal tuxedo with nothing particularly unusual or notable about it. We know from the newspaper clippings we've already mentioned that Andrew and Winnie followed their wedding with a trip to the Northeast, then they returned to the bride's parents' home in Virginia for a short time. Finally, they came home to Greenville. They lived in a large house at 123 South Cherry Street, a few houses down from W.G. Duncan's home at the time, and directly across from the property at 122 South Cherry that would, seven years later, become Thistle Cottage. Sadly, the house burned in the 1980s. Andrew and Winnie Duncan remained married until Andrew's death in 1943. Winnie died in 1969. Andrew and Winnie's son Hamilton eventually inherited Thistle Cottage, and in 1986, he donated the building to the city of Greenville to become a museum. The city operated the museum until 2013 when it was transferred to the library, and we continue to operate the facility today. Thistle Cottage is not open to the public currently as we deal with the COVID-19 pandemic, renovations, and a staff shortage, although we do hope to reopen soon by appointment. In the meantime, however, we are continuing to serve the community by phone and email. If you have a history or genealogy question or request, you can contact us using the contact form on our website or by phone at 270-338-4760. Our staff will be happy to assist you in any way we can. That's all for today's Throwback Thursday video. Thank you for joining me again this morning for a look at our historic collection. Don't forget to follow Muhlenberg County Public Libraries on social media for more Throwback Thursday posts and other information posted every weekday. Have a great day, everyone.